One year had passed since the beginning of our story. It is Christmas Day 1066. It's two months after the Battle of Hastings, and the new King of England has arrived at Westminster Abbey. Only thing is, he's not English. He is French. It is clear that in this opulence, this is no mere church service waiting for him. Murmurs had been whispering around London of the grandeur that the king is here for his coronation. With him, William, the Duke of Normandy, has brought his powerful Norman knights who watch over him as he enters the abbey. And the service begins. The knights can hear the events unfolding behind the closed doors of the abbey. And the celebration has begun. They hear cheers of joy. But one knight mistakes the cheers for a vault. And he bursts through the doors and rushes through the abbey with his sword drawn. The onlookers stare at him with shock and confusion. Then more knights rush through in response to the shears and begin to slaughter those inside. A lantern from the abbey is thrown at the knights, but it lands next to the wooden houses that surround the area, which begin to burst into flames. Those Englishmen who are too slow to flee are killed off one by one by the knights in a rage. The new king is here and his reign is going to be violent. Hello and welcome to the channel. I am the Knight of History. This is part number four of the Norman Conquest story. In this episode, we are going to see how a man who was born as the illegitimate son of a duke became the duke and then the king, and how he actually ruled his kingdom with an iron fist. If you haven't seen part number one, two, or three yet, please go ahead and watch those first. It is an epic story. I suggest you go back and watch them because it's really good to listen and watch things in chronological order. And as always, please like, comment and subscribe. Now, let's get into it. We left off with William, the Duke of Normandy, just winning the Battle of Hastings, dethroning the English King, Harold Godwinson. The thing is though, before William became king, he convinced his Norman knights that if they fought with him, they would be rewarded with English lands. The Anglo-Saxon English nobles had fought with their king, Harold Godwinson, but many of them died in these battles, especially the Battle of Hastings, and therefore their land was taken over by Norman knights. This meant that William I established his royal court with a very French influence, and I rarely mean a very French influence, as he established a royal court consisting of French noblemen only, and that is it. Whoever these new nobles were, were given land, but when they were given this land, they decided to build great big Norman castles, first out of wood on this land because it was quick and easy, but then they replaced these castles with stone. And this was done for a reason. It was done to symbolize to the English that their land no longer belonged to them. This land was occupied by a foreign force. The Anglo-Saxons, the English, of course, did not like this idea and they were occupied by this foreign force that had came out of nowhere in their opinion. Yes, they had lost their English king, but they were still English after all, and they wanted to be the masters of their own destiny. And they would invoke the ideals of freedom against their occupiers and form a rebellion against the Norman rule. The spark of rebellion happened first and foremost in the northeast of England. The local population was sick and tired of being badly treated and paying taxes to foreign lords, so they organized a revolt against their new French lords. Not once, but twice. And on the second time it happened, in 1069, three years after the Battle of Hastings, the northern rebels marched into the castle of Durham, where the lord there, the Norman Earl Robert de Comeres, lived, and they murdered him and his entire garrison of soldiers. The rebels then marched towards the town of York, where the 
famous Battle of Stanford Bridge had taken place. Once they got to York, they proclaimed the nephew of the old king, King Edward the Confessor, who had died in 1065. They proclaimed his nephew, a person called Egar the Elfling, the rightful king of all of England. This whole debacle of the Norman conquest wouldn't have happened if they had declared this person king straight away, but he was overlooked. And of course, they didn't declare him king. So this meant a big old mess and many deaths and yeah, pretty terrible. Well, of course, one of William I's nobles had been killed by these rebels and William I, William the Conqueror, was absolutely furious. In his opinion, these people were contesting his rule and who on earth were they to contest his rule? And he vowed to make an example of them. And boy, oh boy, did he. He marched his army up from London to the north and burned every single village between York and Durham. Not only that, but every single farm they went to. They killed all the animals, they burned the crops, and they laced the fields with salt so that the ground would be infertile. And they were going on a killing spree of genocidal magnitude. Most of the Northeast was now simply an empty wasteland. One estimation says that 100,000 people ended up starving to death in the following months. The effects of this act would be felt for centuries after as the northeast of England would remain as one of the most sparsely populated areas in the entire country. Now this act is known as the harrying of the north and it shows how ruthless William the Conqueror was, especially because some of his loyal supporters were kind of disgusted in this and said that this slaughter cannot go unpunished. By the end of 1069, with the blood of thousands of deaths on his hand, the King of England, William I's rule, was still not secure. There would be one more man that made his contest to his rule. In the east of England, there was a Anglo-Saxon English stronghold. And by 1070, the rebel Hereward the Wake would soon make his name known. In 1070, Hereward the Wake participated in anti-Norman insurrection on the Isle of Ely. And in 1069 or 1070, we don't know for sure, the Danish king even sent a small army to establish a camp on the Isle of Ely, where Hereward the Wake was. Hereward the Wake stormed and sacked Peterborough Abbey in a company with the local men and the Danish warriors. Howard the Wake and his men also were once hiding in the mist of Eli on the island and they noticed Norman knights walking on the road. The band jumped out and ambushed the knights, killing them all and then disappeared off into the mist again. This of course was noticed by William I, the King of England, and he knew that he had to meet these rebels with the same ruthlessness that he had with the harrying of the North just a year earlier. He went with his army to near Eli, which was a marshland, and he built a two mile long wooden causeway across the marshland so his knights could get into the towns. With his Norman knights, he rode into the town of Eli, and executed the Anglo-Saxon rebels. Depending on who you were or who got hold of you, the rebels were either decapitated, blinded with an iron rod, had their limbs chopped off, or if you were really lucky, imprisoned. The rebel leader, Howard the Wake, escaped and turned into a legend. His sword, known as Brain Biter, was a sign of comfort for all of the Anglo-Saxons who lived under the Norman rule. There were only a few Anglo-Saxon nobles who survived the invasion of William I, but those who did, well, it wasn't too good for them. They were forced to swear an oath of loyalty to their new king. And one of his favorite tricks was to take the sons of noblemen and use them as hostages to ensure the noblemen's loyalty. Although he was the King of England, William I didn't actually speak English. Instead, he made the language of his royal court the business of the country and the language of the government, French. 
Although this isn't the only thing he brought with him when he became King of England, and find out how he maintained his newly gained kingdom in part number five, the last part of the Norman Conquest story. Thank you so much for tuning in. I really hope that you enjoyed that. Let me know what you want to watch in the future by commenting down below. Like, comment, and subscribe, the more you know.